Good evening, and welcome to Northumberland Learning Connections' fourth lecture in our series entitled Borders and Walls. My name is Christine Kwiatkowski, and I am one of the directors of NLC. Before we begin, I respectfully acknowledge that Northumberland County, where we are tonight, is located on the traditional ter territory of the Anishinaabe peoples. This territory has been inhabited and cared for from the beginning by Indigenous peoples and is covered by the Williams Treaties. Beyond the Pale, Anti-Semitic Walls is the title of our talk this evening. To present his historical explanation of anti-Semitism as a metaphorical wall, we welcome Norman Raven, a writer, critic, and professor currently teaching at Concordia University's Department of Religions and Cultures. For 13 years, and then more recently two more, Norman directed the Concordia Institute for Canadian Jewish Studies. In this context, he oversaw a range of publications on Canadian Jewish subjects, mounted courses in the area, and collaborated with organizations and departments across the country and in Poland. Norman's books include a recent novel set in Poland and Vancouver called The Girl Who Stole Everything, and the essay collections Hidden Canada, An Intimate Travelogue, and A House of Words, Jewish Writing, Identity, and Memory. He is co-editor of the Canadian Jewish Studies Reader and Failure's Opposite, listening to A.M. Klein. His forthcoming book is a family memoir and history of early 30s emigration to Saskatchewan called Who Gets In? An Immigration Story. It will appear in the spring of 2023 from the University of Winnipeg, uh, sorry, of Regina Press. A native of Calgary, Norman has lived in Vancouver, Toronto, Fredericton, and now Montreal. Please join me in welcoming Norman Raven. Thanks, Christine. I, I appreciate that. Uh, and I appreciate being here uh, and all of your work and Dorothy's efforts in sort of finding a way to frame me inside of what looks like was a very interesting series uh, with more to come, I know. Um, I, I fear or I think that my contribution is the darkest or the, mm, I don't know what to say, most challenging on some level, uh, but my approach I hope will be to give you some uh, cultural frames for thinking about this, not just historical information. Uh, and some of what I present will be also on some level personal, so that I'm uh, here in a way to convey my own connection with this history, which the challenge of giving this talk helped me think about in, in different ways. And then the usual story, which is nice with PowerPoint. The only thing I have up for you tonight really is images. So some of the color of the history will come through the, those. Uh, and maybe if, if you think of them in the questions, we can go back to the images and look at them if, I'm, if you find I'm moving by them too fast. So I will, I will hold this as I, as I will be ready for it, I hope. The Pale of Settlement, a term familiar to most who are interested in Eastern Europe, including Jews with Eastern European ancestry, points, I think, to a little understood historical phenomenon, but one of great importance, an interesting lasting influence. Like the pogroms whose violence was visited on the towns and cities of the Pale in the late 19th and early 20th century, the Pale's history has really been effaced I think this is true to a large degree by the burden of the Holocaust, a more recent and overwhelming instance of Jewish catastrophe. It's our challenge then to lift that history of the pale out of obscurity and to consider what sort of walls the pale enacted over its long history as a key part of the Russian Empire. So very quickly, I won't say them all or, or uh, lead you through it, but you have it in front of you for for now, uh, the sense of where the terminology comes from. And I'd have to tell you that the really important stuff is the English, uh, 
The, the term is most commonly known and used in, in our language, although it traveled in these other contexts too. Uh, and when you look it up, uh, any number of sources will tell you it's Yiddish. I think it really is Russian, and we can, we can find the origin of it in, in the words that maybe someone in this room afterward could voice properly for us. The pale should be understood as the outcome of two major phenomena of the late 18th century. Most simply, the result of Russian imperial and social forces that had to respond to the empire's gaining a very large Jewish population. But more particularly, the pale resulted from the three partitions of the old and large Polish lands, something that was so historically important at the time, substantial portions of which, with their long established Jewish population, fell under czarist control. Three of these years for the partitions were 1772, 1793, and 1795. So if I do this correctly, we can look. I have a few maps because maybe we can ground ourselves and uh, we can come back to it too. And uh, some of you will tell us things that I don't mention. But um, the pale has this kind of shape to it. And of course, this part of the world is uh, before us in the news in ways that it hasn't been for some time. So some of it is familiar to you. Uh, this is a kind of a you know more obvious modern map. So you can see it's north-south uh, stretch. And you could see the way that it uh, moved towards what is just kind of the beginnings of the Western territories of the Tsarist Russian Empire. And then also included a complicating factor that was the full Polish land that we would now think of as contemporary Poland. Uh, and I'll give you another look. Um, that little bulge then is what really the territories we're now familiar with more or less as, as modern Poland. But this little section has a special story which, which I will tell you. Uh, so that's a more uh, kind of historically noted map, gives you the idea that there was these, this thing that the Russians continued to do. They call them different things over the course of, of the decades. Provinces, oblasts, gaburnias, if you're listening to someone talk about them in Yiddish. Uh, and these were all very well known to people and of course are, aren't, aren't well known to us anymore. But I'll mention a few of them in the course of the talk. Um, and then just for color, uh, uh, one of these very pretty uh, historical maps of the Pale. So if you think of these partitions, three of them in the late 18th century, what's going on is a process of geopolitical dismemberment and the disappearance of a very important long-standing empire in its own right, Polish-Lithuanian -Lithu Commonwealth. Uh, and Russia gathered into its empire then territories that would, we would now recognize as Polish, Ukrainian, Belarusian, Moldovan, and to a lesser extent, Lithuanian lands. About 5.7 million new subjects came under the czarist regime. Uh, and it's often said, and it's something we can struggle with to some degree, uh, that Catherine the Great is the founder or the sort of inciter uh, of, of many of the developments associated with the Pale of Settlement. Uh, she ruled Russia 1762 to 96. She was a long standing and important um, player in, in our story. Uh, but I, I would say that her reign included a variety of trends, both towards the outcome that we know of as the Pale of Settlement which I'll tell you as much as I can about, uh, but also trends contrary, so that she was also at certain points in her reign interested in the integration of Jews, not just their exclusion from Russian majority life. It was actually during the reign of an earlier empress, of whom I know little, Elizabeth, uh, that an edict was issued providing for the expulsion of Jews from a variety of par parts of the Russian Empire, in particular ports, including Riga, and from urbanizing centers, including Moscow and Smolensk. So when Elizabeth did this, issued this edict to uh, evict the Jews from these places, her way of expressing her goals had to do with her unwillingness to, quote, profit from the enemies of Christ, so to some degree, the early establishment of ideas that would 
promote and motivate the Pale of Settlement were associated uh, with, with Christian idealism, but this is something that will fade to the background for the most part. The motivation for her expulsions and, evictim, and evictions, that's those by Elizabeth, uh, which would also then resonate in later evictions, was most specifically uh, an economic one. That is, the idea that Russian middle and merchant classes did not appreciate the competition of large populations of Jewish merchant classes. Uh, and then this issue would become that much more pressing after the partitions. So think then really more interestingly and importantly about a, an economic motivation for ideas of eviction um, and resistance to integration. So the effect of the early expulsions uh, by Elizabeth motivated that kind of thinking under Catherine. Uh, and those ideas continued in the period in which she was the uh, head of the Russian regime. And she showed openness to considering them, and she applied them, and then she also never meaningly completed those policies. That's going to become a trend in the things that I tell you, and it's going to remind you of Russians today, <laughs> Russian political activity today, that is that their undertakings go a certain distance, and their logic then has some kind of... Um, uh, weakness, <laughs> complication, and then they back up from the processes that they're undertaking. So that's a theme that you'll, you'll, you'll be able to follow. Following historians' investigations of imperial policy and broader Russian economic and social trends, Catherine, you could say, was an inheritor of a set of phenomena, ideas about Jews, economic patterns, which then continued through her reign and led to 19th century trends that went on largely interrupted until the outbreak of World War I. The issues at stake in the wake of the partitions, so from the late 18th century on, represent quite straightforwardly the challenges of a colonial empire. What form of integration is acceptable? How concretely should segregation of a new population be applied to confirm where a large minority may live, what trades and economic rules those people will be allowed or prohibited from having, and what officially will these people's legal status and citizens, citizenship become. Among the prohibitions practiced in relation to Russian's Jewish population were limits on movement and on the ability to change one's hometown. Historians note, though, that it was not only Jews as a group who found themselves limited in this way under the czars. Still, the manner in which the Pale represented a conscious approach to a large Jewish population, to some degree unwanted, was unique. So we can, to some degree, see things happening to other communities that are not unlike what happened to the Jews, but the completeness or the policy uh, development associated with the Jewish population of the Pale was, was in itself unique. Another way to think about these developments is to think of many hundreds of thousands of Polish Jewish lives being renationalized post partition and so placed in new social, economic, and political positions under a new political authority whose intentions toward them were opaque. Among the early such challenges for Polish and Belarusian Jews was the community's petition to the Tsarist government to be allowed admittance to the ranks of merchants, which would increase residency rights. So in the early years after those three partitions, the first groups that came forward to the czarist authorities were these merchant groups that said, we can't really do our business if you keep us limited to these particular territories. Would you allow us further movement? To the Belarusian Jews following the first partition, Catherine gave her assent. Still, at roughly the same time, royal decrees pushed Jews out of certain villages while denying their right under long-standing Polish arrangements to retain leaseholds, allowing them to distill liquor and operate as proprietors of the ubiquitous Polish country taverns. Very hard to find images of the ubiquitous Polish country taverns, but boy, they were everywhere on every rural roadway and in every uh, minor village and small town and 
middle-sized outskirts of the city. Um, and the activities undertaken by the people that ran those taverns were an intensely important part of the Polish economic so social scene. So uh, I'll say more about that. Uh, and this, you could say, is some kind of uh, fanciful stylized version of a, I don't know, what is this? Is this a partition era tavern? It's a, it's a pretty archaic image of, of, of what, what we might imagine a, a Jewish tavern in Poland to look like. Though I've only begun to sketch the character and impact of the Pale of Settlement on Jewish lives, I'd like to assert our need to pay attention to the variety of lives lived in different parts of the Pale. Uh, and this idea, I think, to some degree was conveyed to me uh, in my discussions with Dorothy as we thought about the talk. I think this is an important missing piece in much generalized discussion about the Pale of Settlement. Although we're considering a huge geographical terrain containing the largest population of Jews in the world at the time, by 1885, as many as four million people, it's worth highlighting the variety of cultural and daily life one could find in that vast territory. <laughs> goes without saying. Um, looking away from the page, not always a good idea. Um, it's true that shtetl life provides a lens through which we can understand what it meant to live within the Pale of Settlement, whether early in its inception in the late 18th century or in its last years in the early 20th. And of the later stages of that period, I do carry some cultural ancestral memory, if you can believe it. So I will try to convey these things to you. I have some personal access to the Polish and Russian shtetl, though I was born in Calgary, an archetypally new North American city. Both my parents, and of course everyone in their ancestral lines for at least a couple hundred years before, were born in Jewish market towns whose history was marked by the pale, even if they lived on its margins. I've not visited my father's birthplace, Suraj, on the Russian borderlands with what is now Belarusia. And you see it there with its little Google pin uh, and by way of Minsk, I guess, and a few other locations you can, to some degree, orient where, where we are there. Uh, my father's family were on the outer edge of what the Russian Empire designated Chernigov province within the Pale, but this was on the far outer reaches of the territories known as the Jewish Pale of Settlement. Sometimes it's true it's best to live at the edge of something large and powerful, which allows it to develop at remove from you. Um, so in the place uh, where my dad was a toddler uh, called Klintzy, uh, you can find some buildings that certainly date to his time there as a two-year-old. Uh, this is one. Uh, and this was the look of his family uh, about the time that they finally were going to leave for, for Canada. Uh, and uh, they're distinctive for any number of reasons, and that would almost be another talk. Uh, but the fellow in the center did have some involvement in the liquor trade in his part of Belarus, although he was a very learned character as well, uh, a, a kind of an economic, social uh, crossover figure, did a whole range of things. And they had obviously a bunch of kids. They're not all in the picture. But their secularized look is, is indicative of their uh, integration, you'd have to say. <laughs> So uh, it, it's, it's a telling photograph, uh, especially those little kids with their little Russian sailor suits. So I haven't been to Suraj, and I haven't been to Klintzy, and I think probably won't ever go. But I have been to my mother's birthplace, Radzanov, northwest of Warsaw, four times. And now that COVID's over, I'll, I'll go back. Here you have an excellent overhead photo of contemporary Radzanov taken helpfully for us by a local sports photographer and not by a drone camera, as you might have thought. Although this is a 20th century photo, the surround of a 19th century shtetl, one admittedly on the far western borderlands of Tsarist control in that little bump that I showed you called Kingdom Poland, it's revealed to be remarkably intact. 
The status, even the existence of a Polish Jewish market town like Radzanov, and the many hundreds of others like it, was owed to the fact of it being on land privately owned by a Polish noble family. So here we're on pre-partition ground, thinking about what existed uh, before the Pale of Settlement swept its way in, in so many different directions. Uh, and in, in what way the, so, the, the, the lives of these people were established prior to the Pale. Um, so uh, the, the existence of the town owed its, owed its life to the, the fact of it being privately owned by a Polish noble family, as well as to a series of grants over many decades that offered Jews the right to live, assert their community organizations and self-government while undertaking a variety of businesses in the vicinity of the town. In the case of Radzanov, considerable numbers of Jews began to arrive in the area in the second half of the 18th century. So to this place, about an hour northwest of Warsaw, if you take a, a, a vehicle, um, Jews start to show up in the mid-1700s, just 30, 40 years before the Pale of Settlement comes into existence, decades before the imposition of it. They come as a result of a privilege issued by the town's owner. So you have to think about the idea of a, a person owning this town. She was Dorota Nishitska, the chamberlain of Płotsk from the Karshevsky clan. She allocated, allocated to the Jewish settlement two streets and a plot of land for a Jewish cemetery and a synagogue, not the one you see because the one that she would have been aware of was built, of course, of wood at that early stage. And Nishitska de decreed as well that the Jews settling in her town should have the right to trade in all goods, including the production of alcohol. So remarkably here, from the Radzanov archives, dated June 5th, 1763, in the wonderful scribal handwriting of rural Polish record books. You have the acknowledgement of the rights of Jews to live on Mostova and Rychinska streets, the latter leading to the market square and confirming the number of cubits distance their houses should maintain from the parish church. So, Basilica. have an impressive basilica. Okay, to the document, Nishitska affixes her seal, confirming these rights. Do we see the seal? Not in that uh, reproduction. Uh, for future ages. In the early 20th century, so in the twilight of Russian hegemony on the Polish borderlands, a Polonized Jewish Konitz family, family named Konitz, managed the once noble estate around Radzanov, cultivating hops, chicory, and asparagus. Asparagus is hard to grow, I'm, I'm told. I highlight these details in part for the richness of their Polishness and for their dates just prior to the partitions and then near their end, but also to signal how varied in local character was the life of Jews in the expanse of lands of partitioned Poland. Certain patterns, well established in parts of the Pale, had little impact in the parts of Poland my family settled in, which was included in the geographical region known as Congress Poland, an area ceded to the Russians late after Napoleon's defeat in 1815. It's such complicated history, I can hardly ever keep it clear. But the Poles are very interested in that history, and they're big historical reenactors, the Poles. And if you go online, you can find YouTube videos of, of Napoleon's uh, army traveling through this area. The Poles are dressed as Napoleonic military people and Polish military people, and they spend a weekend reenacting these early 19th century battles. So what did Jews busy themselves with in these shtetlich, these burgeoning market towns? They minded rye fields, they distilled liquor, they sold liquor at local taverns, which often doubled as inns. These are among the many economic roles that Jews succeeded in. Now what you see though in my photograph of Radzanov is something more mundane, one might say even 
archetypal, so effective, <clears throat> excuse me, in helping us focus upon the character of the shtetl. So here you see the thing you see the uh, the fact that China, the market is where it's no longer active, of course. Uh, but uh, Xinjiang is a market square with almost wholly Druid owned buildings. And they may win them, but they also ran stores out of the front of them. And then as you move outward <coughs> from the market square, there are still Jewish families, but sometimes the poorer ones. And they're mixed in increasingly with non-Jewish Poles. And so you move out into the agricultural areas and you get fewer and fewer Jews, but still some few. Uh, and in this case, Razanov happened to be on uh, an important set of riverways, which eventually not too far away at, at that production of this Hila River. Uh, so lots of fishing activity in the area. Uh, so um, at Radzanov, following a common pattern, these houses around the square were largely Jewish, out of which inhabitants, sometimes the women in each family, ran dry goods stores, sold sundries like ribbons and material for clothing, while their husbands and sons operated as glaziers, tailors, furriers, and bakers. Non-Jewish Radzanovers lived in the surrounding streets and then further out. These people brought their livestock and crops for sale on the weekly market day. While they were there, they did business with the Jewish store and stall owners. But the reputation of some of the Jewish craftspeople, for instance, a noted furrier and a tailor, would also attract customers that included the local landowning noble or the region's priest and seminarians. Here you see the 20th and now 21st century domain of the local priest with the basilica in the background, built there after the wooden church was replaced. The basilica stands opposite the miraculous, miraculously intact shell of the synagogue with its Moorish decorative touches, looking like this. It was built in the early 20th century, so in this surround, complete with flooded riverbanks, you have a snapshot of how lives were lived in many Polish Jewish families over the centuries, including during the time of the Pale of Settlement. But if we move east to consider the lands more properly thought of the Pale, or more archetypally, let's say, thought of the Pale, especially in areas of the Russian Empire that now, now fall into Eastern Poland or Western Ukraine, the story of the shtetl under Russian rule in the Pale of Settlement is a story of decline. So I tell the story of Radzanov with some level of upbeat lovability, as you can tell. But if you think about shtetl life further east, always risky to do this, but there you have the map in front of you. I think of it as a story of decline. With the partitions came a new name in Russian, Miestetsko, so we can start to call it something else. And an effort was made over many decades to devise ways to legally define these places in light of Russian bureaucratic regulations. They've been doing it in the Ukraine in the recent months in much more brutal fashion. This never fully succeeded. In the late stages of the Pale's existence, an 1897 Russian census counted 462 small towns with Jewish majority in the Pale, while around a quarter of those 462 were as much as 80% Jewish. So this was the populace they were trying to deal with. Some 56 of those 462 in 1897 had been confiscated as Polish crown assets by the Russian treasury. So they were doing all kinds of things to try to deal with what this thing was, the shtetl in its kind of specific and special Polish historical context. And they were trying to make it over in their own way. One way was to simply confiscate the land from the noble family. It was not so straightforward for the Russian authorities to acquire the private landlord's town. One could say that in the years following the partitions, under czarist legal and bureaucratic rule, these towns were made over to varying degrees in the image of the pale. Russian governing policy aimed, not always successfully, 
at undermining the economic and social patterns set up in Polish private towns. This included efforts by the Russian treasury to buy up the private town and break the link between the Polish noble and his Jewish leaseholds. It was through this arrangement that Jewish managers had overseen rye harvests, liquor distillation, and rural taverns. So this might sound crazy to anyone in the room who is a business person, but the uh, authorities were basically stepping into an economic pattern that was long established and rather successful, trying to remake it in some new way, but basically picked it apart, uh, undermined it. Russian regulations regarding economic status and rights of habitation varied over time and in different parts of the pale. Russian statesmen tended to see the shtetl as competition for Russian trading cities and saw them too as holdouts of power bases of the Polish nobility. In this way, regardless of their common and important position in the society of the Russian pale, czarist bureaucratic forces aimed to undermine the shtetlach. Russian state institutions established themselves in the Miestetsko. What would they bring? A post office, a magistrate, a government office, the latter of which became often an outpost of Russian spying, and the source of reports back to the metropole on the successes and failures of government efforts to both administer and economically appropriate the shtetl. A further administrative effort brought about the appearance of the crown rabbi in Russian, this thing, the Kazioni Ravin in Russian parlance. And here you have a really kind of a, a funny coincidence between this imperial imposition on religious life in the pale and myself. It's no joke. The crown rabbi had a range of bookkeeping and officiating responsibilities. While Russian officialdom expected he also would aid them in their effort to influence and control Jewish communal life. So they weren't just installing postal inspectors and spies. They would also send from a part of the Russian lands, uh, uh, usually from a, a, an urban center, a representative who in some way would compete with the local actual rabbi the crown rabbi. The crown rabbi became a competing ritual actor whose efforts did not really replace the more traditional rabbinic figures in small Eastern communities. So my last name, which traveled with my father's family from the Belarusian borderlands of the Pale, signals that we had crown rabbis in our ancestral line, not necessarily men whose presence in their community was fully appreciated. And just to give you an idea of the variety of types who held this position, the Yiddish writer Sholem Aleichem, born Rabinovich, so he shares my name but in a different form, was for a few short years in the early 1880s a crown rabbi in the Ukraine, some 200 kilometers east of Kiev. So I have a few other ways now of trying to contextualize the pale. Uh, it's kind of a sprawling topic, uh, and I'll talk about it as an urban phenomenon, but then also as a rural one. And in that way, that vast te territory might become for, for you something that you uh, can uh, focus in your minds in, in certain ways. So the urban pale. In the first half of the 19th century, Jews were prohibited from living in key cities, including Kiev, Nikolaev, and Sevastopol. They were prevented from living in villages as well, in certain provinces of the Pale, as well as from settlement in villages within 33 miles of the empire's western frontiers. But restrictions were notably lighter in the part of the Russian Empire known as Kingdom of Poland, or the Vistula provinces, which included Warsaw's nearly three quarters of a million Jews, and of course as well the 300 Jewish inhabitants of my mother's birthplace at Radzanov. Jews in Kingdom Poland were allowed to move freely between the kingdom and the rest of the Pale, although they were banned from entering the Russian interior. This is the thing that my maps haven't properly highlighted. So we see Kingdom Poland, we see the really substantial and dramatic uh, 
territories, which we think of as the Pale of Settlement proper, and then we have the huge uh, remnant of, of the Russian lands that falls to the east. So often the, the uh, limitations on movement, which were somewhat unpredictable as I described them, certainly uh, delimited movement into the, the center, further uh, east into the regions of the Russian Empire. Jews in uh, Kingdom Poland were allowed to, sorry, I said this, were allowed to move freely between the kingdom and the rest of the Pale, though they were banned from entering the Russian Empire, the Russian interior. Congress Poland, or the Kingdom of Poland, experienced the most substantial industrial and general economic growth in the empire and attracted a large number of Jews from the Pale, a trend that increased in the 1880s and 1890s in the wake of pogroms and expulsions. Most dramatically, in 1891, 30,000 Jews were sent out of Moscow. As you begin to see, this is a movable, varied, often revamped set of walls associated with the Pale of Settlement. Its underlying idea is to separate Jews from other Russian populations, but it underwent constant and unpredictable change. Regulations were imposed, sometimes lifted, not applied, and then not applied throughout large parts of the Russian-Polish lands. And there were often ostentatious exceptions to the rules, such as the Crimean city of Odessa, a port founded around the time of the last partition, which gained immense economic importance in the late imperial period, in part through its openness to immigration, including to that of Jews. This part of the world in the Kherson province of modern Ukraine is once again, of course, in dramatic uh, presence in world affairs as the Russian army aims to end Ukrainian independence there. Competing with the Greek minority for Odessa's rich grain trade, Jews in the city numbered 17,000 in the mid-1850s, and by the early 20th century, Jews owned half Odessa's factories and small workshops, Notably, the early founding figures of Odessa's Jewish concerns came not from other parts of the Pale, but from Austrian Galicia. So I'll just go quickly back to the map. Ah, oh, wrong way. Don't want to reveal that stuff yet. Um, certainly when you see any map of the Pale of Settlement, Odessa's included. So th this, this complex pattern of unpredictability, no, no matter how how complex it seems, it, it continues to, to, to complexify. Odessa as, uh, wrong way, Ribbon Pale. Okay, so, um, think for a bit uh, first about uh, Let me see where I was, R uh, rural pale. So now, uh, if we've said a little bit about cities, ideas of exclusion from cities, uh, think of how the pale operated in rural parts of the Russian lands. One way of understanding the impetus for the pale is to follow the regulations and prohibitions meted out by czarist authorities to rural Jews. Those who dwelt in villages, dorfs or shtetlach in Yiddish, these were applied haphazardly too and unpredictably. One of their key focuses was on evicting Jews from village leaseholds in order to undermine their role as managers of taverns and inns and as producers of alcohol. So breaking up the rural economic status quo established under Polish nobility. These undertakings were actually established by a very specific statute of 1804 which was created by a committee of minister ministers from Tsar Alexander's inner circle. This is the beginning of about six or seven uh, czarist high minister committees which were set up to make some kind of finalized plan for the population of Jews in the Pale of Settlement. The 1804 statute focused on evicting Jews from rural lands and villages. Comprehensive lists of rural Jewish populations were drawn up, but in practice little resulted from these efforts. A later iteration of the Tsar's Ministers Committee withdrew the plan. 
But then, in 1883, a major eviction of rural Jews did take place in Smolensk and Pskov Psk provinces, the latter in the far western regions of the Russian Empire. At that time, over 20,000 were affected, expelled from their homes miserably in wintertime. The outcome of this start and stop policy of, of eviction did result in 1835 in the legalization of Jew Jewish presences in parts of the Pale, removing their right to live in some areas, including two provinces, Mogilev and Vitebsk. A subsequent government committee with the heady title Committee for the Determination of Measures for the Radical Reorganization of the Russian Jews took a new approach that of sorting Jews, as the official language of the time had it, into categories related to farming, merchant activity, property ownership, with the aim of leaving again the leaseholders outside of those categories and subject to eviction. In 1852, this resulted in the eviction of Jewish populations in villages of the once Polish-Russian borderlands. But at the same time, other limitations were removed Mogilev and Vitebsk provinces were reopened and Jews were allowed to buy agricultural land there. The crowning events of all of this, some eight decades after the inception of the Pale, are the pogroms of 1881. So here a kind of a shift in our narrative. And in response to those, a sixth ministerial committee reproposed eviction. So, the Russian authorities' idea of how to respond to pogroms <laughs> kicked the Jews out of the territories in which those pogroms are happening. Uh, the policy that was introduced, initially called temporary rules, but later known, well known as the May laws, limited movement and any form of new leasehold, but imposed no further evictions. The May laws are notorious and well known as a czarist anti-Jewish response to the wave of pogroms and they were really not a worsening of Jewish restrictions, but a kind of legal affirmation of the status quo. Still, in popular Jewish imagination, they represent a major impetus to immigration from Russian lands in the late 19th century, and they do send large numbers west and ultimately towards North America, mostly towards the United States. Further czarist committees in the 1880s reconsidered past government edicts, leading to the issuance in 1894 of a state monopoly on the production and sale of alcohol. So this is always lurking in the background, this economic motivation to take this industry away from its established patterns and somehow gain the money earned from it for the state. So late 19th century, issuing of a state monopoly on the production and sale of alcohol. In this, we have a clear example of how anti-Jewish edicts were motivated by government economic goals. Anti-Jewish edicts in the pale often arose from these kinds of machinations in Moscow. So at this stage, late 19th century, they set up about 600 state liquor stores, many of those planned and not actually completed, and the bulk of them in the countryside. Rural taverns and inns were closed, Jews were forced to seek other livelihoods. In the early years of the 19th century, the czarist government made another about face, also based on economic concerns, reopening villages to Jewish settlement. As well, Jews with academic degrees, students, members of certain guilds were allowed to settle in once prohibited rural areas. And these trends continued. In 1905 and after, more villages were opened, Dentists, carpenters, masons, plasterers, bridge builders, and others were added to the list of Jews now welcome in rural settlements. So the Russian obsession with delimiting the lives of Jews, with moving them out of certain areas while allowing them back into others, continued until the outbreak of World War I. The pale, decade after decade of official committee work, policy pronouncements, and statutes with relation to the Jews of the rural empire reveals, I think, salient characteristics, not just of Jewish Russian life, but as Russian life, of Russian life overall. These characteristics include 
waves of mass eviction, periods of calm, targeted leg legislation like the 1804 statute and the May laws, followed by relaxation or even reversal of these restrictions. So what sort of walls do these policies help us envision? Walls that moved like bad weather across the countryside, rising and falling based on short-sighted goals, on economic antagonism, on the appearance of anti-Jewish conspiracy theories with an ever-present unpredictability and an absolute tendency for them to collapse. These were walls built by incompetence, devised through bureaucratic menace and ideological fantasies that rose and faded in popularity. The pale was constituted by walls that authorities were forever half finishing on the way to pronouncing their removal in favor of some new shoddy construction. And I have to say it, it sounds like Russia today. It sounds like we're living through a, a much uh, more grotesque uh, set of patterns that in some way I, I learned about as I prepared this talk for you. So just a few last things to tell you which also kind of present other ways of focusing or contextualizing the pale. That paragraph that I just read maybe should be read a second time, but it's, it's in some ways my, one of my ways of uh, thinking about the, the topic overall. There are other ways of examining the pale of settlement as a phenomenon built of actual but often porous walls. And one of these is through the lens of violence. In a terrain that was so convolutedly designed to separate groups, to prohibit movement, to limit a variety of economic and social interactions between Jewish and non-Jewish communities, violence became a disruptive feature, one that helps us further characterize life in the Pale. The characteristic form of violence visited on, visited on Jews in the Pale, especially after the 1881 assassination of Alexander II, was known as the pogrom, a word that's now used liberally to describe group-on-group -group violence of a sustained, targeted kind. The word is Russian, meaning to wreak havoc, to demolish violently. And in Russian lands, it referred to large, sustained anti-Jewish riots that represented full attacks on communities that included the looting of stores and homes, mass rape, beatings, and killings. Waves of pogroms took place in the early 1880s and more substantially between 1903 and 1906, the years leading up to and straddling the 1905 revolution. If we focus on that second wave in the early 20th century, initiated in the Ukrainian city of Kishinev in 1903, we can count some 650 pogroms localized violence, fully disruptive and destructive of Jewish communal life. Historians differ over the role of czarist ministers, military and police in fomenting this violence, but they agree it was prompted and promoted by the government's customary anti-Semitic outlook, exemplified by the overarching pale phenomenon. Historians also point to the reigning social and economic collapse in the years straddling 1905, this included wide-scale rural unrest, poor harvests, severe clashes between peasants and police, major strikes in cities including Baku, Tiflis, Odessa, and Kiev, urban riots, political and student demonstrations. In most of these instances, when these violences fell over into pogrom activity, pr police proved incompetent, unprepared, undermanned, and at times willfully involved in pogromist violence. And a pattern often developed where local police or military detachments gave anti-Jewish violence free reign until the point it threatened to spill over into riots and looting beyond Jewish targets. I'm in no way a theorist or philosopher of violence, so I proceed here to a degree on instinct. Since the pogrom took shape as a salient characteristic of Jewish life in the Pale, it must have something special to teach us about the time and place where it happened. In this way, our consideration of the pale can provide us indirectly 
with fresh context within which to appreciate the meaning of Russian pogroms. On the most general term, the pale provided for a variety of ways to separate non-Jewish and Jewish subjects. It stipulated where Jews should and should not live, and though it was not conclusive in its efforts to categorize the sort of Russian subject Jews would be, it proposed a variety of legal prohibitions by which the majority of Jews would live. Here I do feel there is an analogy between the Russian pale and the American South, as both engineered and aimed to validate in separate but near societies the relative intimacy of groups that were meant to be separated from each other. But consider this, through the violence of the pogroms, this separation was leveled. Property was looted, taken away for the looter's use or sale, bodies were beaten, women raped. The everyday relations, however strictly ordained between Jews and non-Jews, were transgressed. Limits were exceeded. Non-Jewish life burst violently into the Jewish sphere and left it ransacked, violated. There are a host of photographs of the pogrom years, and I'll only just quickly show you one. These images show bodies laid out, sometimes covered in the street, but the record of this aspect of the Pale's history is not familiar to most people, I would say including Jews, with Eastern European background. The great writer of the 20th century who witnessed and wrote with painful irony of the Odessa pogrom of 1905 is Isaac Babel. One of his masterpieces, The Story of My Dovecote, is a day in the life view of the outbreak of violence, its impact on the narrator's family and his surrounding neighborhood. A precocious child, one of the first things the narrator loses is a beloved dove. Babel's tone, even in this material, is suggestive of the kind of writing that eventually antagonized the Stalinist censor and led to the writer's arrest and murder. Here I'll read you just a few short paragraphs of Babel's story, which portray a pogrom in progress and convey this notion I developed as I was thinking about the talk for tonight of a, an intimacy that comes of the act of the pogrom. Old men with bears were carrying the portrait of a neatly combed czar. Banners with sepulchral saints fluttered above the religious procession. Inflamed old women were running in front of it. When the muzik in the vest saw the procession, he pressed the hammer to his chest and went running after the banners while I, waiting for the procession to pass, carefully made my way to our house. It was empty. Its white doors stood open. The grass by the dove coat was trampled down. Kuzma, our janitor, was the only one who had not left our courtyard. Kuzma was sitting in a shed laying out Shoyle's dead body. <clears throat> The wind brings you in like a bad splinter, the old man said when he saw me. You were gone for ages. See how the townsfolk have hacked our grandpa down. Kuzma began sniffling, turned away, and pulled a perch out of the fly of grandpa's trousers. Two perches had been shoved into grandpa, one into his fly, the other into his mouth. Although grandpa was dead, one of the perches was still alive and quivering. Kuzma, I whispered. Save us. Last few things. I haven't gone too, too over time. I'm OK. I planned it. I, I hope the plan, the plan is working. OK, last few things, honestly. I turn to another writer now, quickly, lesser known, but equally crucial in his time, who was witness not only to pogrom violence, but the destruction wreaked on Jewish communities by the First World War and the Russian Revolution. This is S.Y. Ansky, a good-looking guy, born Shloima Zanvil Rappaport in 1863, who was himself a child of the pale, of the Belarusian shtetl called Chashniki, though he was raised in nearby Vitebsk, an in, a place better known as the youthful home and subject of Marc Chagall's most famous paintings, which I've robbed you of. It's not here. Sorry, but some of you will know what I'm imagining. Jews had lived in Anski's birthplace since the mid-17th century, 
They were not allowed to live in peasant villages in Vitebsk pr province, but clearly they were an important part of larger trading places like Ansky's birthplace. He was said to have been raised in a tavern run by his mother. So his earliest memories would have been of the inn as crossroads, the Jewish household as a byway for travelers of all kinds, and a dispenser of the well-loved local brews. I think of this building as a possible extant building that might have once been a, a tavern. His early, Anski's early intellectual interests, in addition to his traditional religious education, led him to abandon the setting of his upbringing in the Pale, first for the Donbass region, now too famously under dispute, for Western Europe, an illegal residence in St. Petersburg. His interest in social revolutionary movements led him to seek out peasant life in the countryside. So as a social activist, he was driven to the part of the pale that the regulations aimed to deny him and led him to work at a salt pro processing plant and also as a tutor. Ansky developed deep intellectual and socially engaged ethnographic interests which led him to focus his attention on the pale that he'd left as a youth. He set up ethnographic expeditions, a return to study the five million Jews of the pale. And these sent him along with talented colleagues, sorry, <clears throat> on a recovery of what some of them called a dark continent. In this way, Ansky and his ethnographic cohort would explore Russian Jewish history and folklore the way British explorers headed off to discover, as they put it, colonial Africa. I raise Ansky in this talk conv to convey how idiosyncratic and to a great extent unknown the history of the Pale is. His example stands as a late stage phenomenon. His life and work straddle the final three quarters of a century of the Russian Empire, but still he's a revealing example in the years before World War I, he led his ethnographic expeditions to the Pale to gather folk songs, sayings, stories, spells, and folklore in 60 towns over three provinces of the Pale. These were Volhynia, Podolia, and Kiev provinces. With his colleagues, he was at the vanguard of a group of assimilated Russian Jewish intellectuals most of them with personal roots in the pale, who reappeared in town squares, towing their Edison recording machine and striving to behave with proper comportment, not smoking on Sabbath and talking Yiddish rather than Russian. So I'm not sure if this is coming across, but um, here you have a fellow, it's not in that photograph, but he's on the left hand with the impressive hat and he's here with another impressive hat. He's funded to go back on these ethnographic expeditions to the Pale of Settlement in the early 20th century. The idea in these people's minds is this place is disappearing. This culture is being trampled by the unpredictable chaos of war and we need to protect it by way of gathering it, a sort of a salvage anthropology project. And the list of things that they collected was much longer than the one, the one that I've uh, I've mentioned so far, and this is actually a photograph of him uh, undertaking the kind of interview that he did with people in the pale, here in somebody's living room. And here they would set up this Edison recording machine, which some of the people who encountered it thought, of course, was uh, some kind of work of the devil or so something along those lines. Um, but the kids too quickly figured out that it, he'd pay them a few pennies in order to sing a song into the recording machine. So in fact, a lot of the things they collected were, were often made up. So the, the, the ethnographic project had, had its own problems. Um, who were these characters, Ansky and his cohort? They were modernizing men who came to save what they saw as the threatened folk, religious, and creative culture of a territory that would soon experience even worse European violence than was known in the past. And the best known result of Ansky's ethnographic work is a play that some of you might know called the Dybbuk, said to be the most performed work of Jewish theater. And it's drawn from his visits to the Shtetlach of the Pale, 
and create it as a tableau of what Anski found as he heard and interviewed and surreptitiously recorded the voices of places not like his own birthplace. So if you get a chance to see a performance of the Dybbuk or the movie that they made in Poland in 37 in Yiddish but with English subtitles, um, to some degree you get some kind of negative mirror image, echo of things that Anski discovered as he with his cohorts did their ethnographic work in the Pale of Settlement. Uh, and one of his pals said this about how the idea for the play, the Dybbuk, uh, arrived for him. And then I'm almost done. We stayed with a wealthy Jew in Yarmolintsi. During dinner, we witnessed a secret silent courting game between the host's daughter and the yeshiva student who died at the house, dined at the house. The father interrupted this modestly conducted romance by announcing that he had decided to marry his daughter off to another man. During the night, we were awakened by the girls sobbing. Anski got up and took notes in his notebook until the morning with great excitement. This love made a great impression on him. The Dybbuk then, like Anski's early 20th century ethnographic work, provides a time capsule of the pale, an imagined version of the life of these small places. When we watch a contemporary version of the play, or the movie of 37, some kind of portrait of the Pale of Settlement is offered. But it's likely true that beyond recognizing, the, beyond recognizing the shtetl, the archetypal home of many Eastern European Jews, the finer details of Pale life and culture remain covert. The history of the Pale is hard to see, hard to find. One last anecdote. Um, in, in my reading to try to see if there was some way that we could feel that the pale still casts a shadow, I did find some curious research and investigations done by sociologists, mostly in the Ukraine, of um, ideas, uh, mindsets, voting patterns, uh, tendencies to support certain parties that the researchers seemed to feel were specific to areas where the pale was most coherent in the past and also to the places where the pogroms were most specifically uh, uh, ha had happened. And the things that they found in these places, so in the, in the places where the Jews of the pale are now entirely absent, was that they leave a kind of a footprint in this way. Those people left in those um, places historically centered in the pale and the, the pogrom lands uh, have a unique kind of distinctive in-group attitude. They also tend to continue to support communist political parties and they, <laughs> and, and they have a distinctive dislike of market economy. So if we, can trust the, if we could trust the research, they don't know why they think this way and maybe the researchers are only making certain kinds of studied guesses about this, but that it did seem that even in the absence of the Jewish population in these territories, a kind of a, a life of the mind still exists and is being expressed on these kinds of fronts um, unknowingly by, by, by the population that remains behind. So these after effects are compelling and evocative in light of how little is generally known about the Pale of Settlement. Memory is weak in the vicinity of the Pale, though it overshadows the territories where it was put in place in ways that the statistic statisticians seem to find. Former Jewish presence, violence, and absence are, are still inscribed on the social landscape. A traveler with our talk in hand might take a detour, a walkabout, and managed to find herself in the shadow thrown by the pale's unwieldy walls. And that's where I'll stop. Thanks. Norman, thank you for walking us through this oppressive period in time and space that divided peoples in Eastern Europe. Your account certainly resonated with me as I recalled the stories of my grandparents 
that my grandparents told of the struggles in Poland during the early 1900s for Jews and non-Jews as a result of both visible and invisible walls. Thank you for sharing your expertise, your understandings, and your research with us this evening. We're now going to take a very quick break. People uh, are welcome to help themselves to coffee and tea at the back. We will come back quickly, though, for our Q&A, because I know that's going to be um, really exciting for us to hear your questions. So please help yourself to uh, the refreshments and come back to our chairs for Q&A time. So any questions? Where are the questions coming from? Gil, please. I'm interested in have, what happened after uh, communism took over. Yeah, what happened in the, in the Pale, and what happened were the uh, Jews allowed to go back into the rest of Russia right. at that point in time? Or so, what? boy, is that a big question, and, and you're right to ask it. But the, the, the bottom line is the Russian Revolution ended it. In terms of this totally convoluted story that I tell you about regulations and where you can live, and every little detail that I listed uh, evaporates. And Jewish citizenship becomes straightforward uh, in the early period of the post-1917 Soviet empire. So big news, you could say. And a lot of Jews believed in that, but of course it didn't pan out. But <laughs> you could think of it as the end. Yeah, those, everything about it, every aspect that's totally nonsensical bureaucratic setup pff, evaporates. Yeah, and citizenship becomes real. Thank yeah. you. Question here? I guess the question we should ask is <clears throat> how did all the Jews find themselves in that? How did the Jews find themselves yeah. in this part of the world? Yeah. Well, so that too is really a Polish story. So for those po po pol polonophiles in the room, I mean, so there had been the, the, this extensive movement of Jews east, which began in the medieval period. So some of you know this. Uh, and it's then ex ex made extremely more important after the expulsions from Spain. And then the Poles, in, in most cases, the kings were inviting them so that you have important cases of Polish kings as early as the 1300s and after, uh, laying out documents a bit like my fancy one from my mom's neighborhood, um, saying we welcome, and this edict suggests that Jews will have rights, et cetera, et cetera. And the populations moved substantially through those centuries, so that the freak of history is that they landed under the Russian authority. Under the Poles, they had a, they had a different future one would say. So that, that I, I think that's maybe the most straightforward way to answer. Well, and the other thing was the, no, the Polish nobility were not allowed to handle money, so the Jews fulfilled that need. Right, and, po and the po those Polish nobles like to enjoy life as well, I, I, I like to say, yeah. Uh, so that was, that's a fascinating um, sub-narrative, like in the background of the the story I'm telling, the relationship between, I keep referring to them as leaseholders, but it's uh, Jewish figures who become very closely related with the Polish noble families and then develop this economic and social uh, pattern that the Russians came and aimed to destroy. So just to follow up on that, how what happened that the Russians got this hunk of land and population? What caused that to happen? These partitions. So maybe I should have done better with that. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just. So there's three of them, and it's it's this global disaster for the Polish Lithua Lithuanian Commonwealth, which is just the dismembering of that nation. So you wouldn't at the time have it on the map any longer, and it it happened over those decades. So the the earliest date is the 1780s, and then it ends in the 1790s. But the the three empires are dismembering. The Austro-Hungarians are getting some, the Prussians are getting some, and the Russians just land this huge population in the east of Jews. So the Austro-Hungarians got this place that we called Galicia. It had a lot of Jews in it too. And the Prussians get another piece of it. So it was a case of um, global dismemberment. The, 
Well, there was, uh, you're right that there's some wars involved, but it's more about the collapse of the Polish Commonwealth. Yeah, and also their own, you know, poor degree of negotiation with these different powers and too, too complex f uh, for us to worry about, but, uh, and it happens over those decades. It doesn't all happen at once. And then there's this bizarre subplot of the Kingdom of Poland, which only falls into the pale by way of Napoleon. Napoleon's all the way across. Can you believe it? What's he doing there? He's, he's well, he's going to Russia, but he's he's in Poland and he's going to lose. And then that property uh, around that bulge again gets passed over. The French lose the 1815 decision, and the Russians get the Kingdom of Poland. So it's all this um, geopolitical stuff. Thank you, Dorothy. I've got a couple. Well, I've got a lot of questions, but I'll ask the, the one that struck me most is, you know, we've all watched The Fiddler on the Roof. Yes. How realistic is that? And yeah. how similar is it to the play? Dybbuk? Yeah, that's interesting. Well, so Sholem Aleichem comes up. He's, he, I'm, uh, I'm a compatriot. He was also, uh, he, like my ancestors, he was a crown rabbi. Um, he, he's the one who writes the stories on which Fiddler on the Roof uh, is based. So the source material there is really good stuff. Um, and the Yiddish stories that Sholem Aleichem writes about the Ukraine and sometimes city life and sometimes rural life are really are relevant to what we're talking about. And the end point of the Fiddler on the, on the Roof narrative also does have to do with pogroms. So he's on our territory. Uh, I guess the, uh, the, it really depends on where you get your fiddler on the roof. I mean, that, that, I think it's the most successful amateur theater play in the world. It's done more than any other play. They do it in North Korea, you name it. It gets done everywhere. So there's something resonating there universally. Um, and I, I do think so, to some degree the play is maybe not as terrific a source for the kind of thing we're trying to figure out as the stories of Sholem Lechem. So maybe that's a, that would be where I would go. But that's still Fiddler on the Roof. Those are his characters. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. The other question is, you talked about the pogroms. Yes. And you said the police and the magistrates allowed them. So who instigated them? Were they roaming gangs or well, the townspeople? Or? Well, I sort of hedged, hedged my bets. You just said, uh, what did you say? They. Uh, you, what did I, what, how did you quote me? It was, <laughs> they, I have to go back to my notes, but, but it was understanding that the authorities allowed the pogroms yeah. to, to exist, but, but they didn't instigate them. It was my no. impression of what you said. So I who, think that's, who did? Yeah, so it's awful and complex. Uh, and in some ways, every region had its own terrible story. So the very substantial pogrom in Odessa that um, Isaac Babel portrays had to do with disagreements between Greeks and Jews. Um, and they were competing for the port business. So, and, and, that, and that opened out into something more um, open-ended in which other people got involved in the violence. So maybe that's a good example rather than trying to give you others. That is that in, in each case there would be a, there, there would be a sort of a, a touch point. But the overarching problem I would say, and I, I, I tried to convey this in the talk, is that um, officialdom gave no real reason for you not to do it. So any of the expressions of authority that should have been made, and they do say that in the areas where the police were a little bit different and made some effort, the pogroms were stopped. I do think of Ottawa in this. <laughs> Sorry to say, say it. Uh, but that because of the, you know, the, the overall phenomenon of the pale and the absence of moral authority on the part of the czarist uh, politicians, and then also a lack of uh, input so that uh, military and policing would be made clear to them that this is part of your job, you know, you have to get on this. So I, I think that often when you see the portrayals, e even in drawings of a pogrom, the military or the police are on the fringe. Uh, 
So if those drawings are, are accurate, um, they're not absent, they're also not instigators, but then on some level if they're present and they're not, you know, so it's such a complicated uh, pheno pattern and phenomenon. Um, that, that, uh, that would be my way of trying to answer that. Yeah, um, and then certain things would trigger them that were more sub sort of clearly anti-Semitic source points. Uh, as my grandmother always used to say, in the little Polish village, Easter time was the worst because if the priest was not a great guy, there was not nice things said in the church and then some of the young guys would get, dr would get drunk and then you'd have some trouble. So these, these are the different ways that I would try to enter that, that tough question, yeah. Thank you, we have a question here. Uh, with all this legal chaos and um, uncertainty, well put. what um, kind of pushback was there from the Jewish community? And by, by that I mean, were there, um, did they create underground economies? Did they go out and make, the, make their uh, alcohol in a barn? Uh, these kind of things. It's a great question. I did not explore that with enough care. Um, and the thing that did develop mostly to the, in so I'm thinking now here of pogroms, but you're thinking too more broadly of sort of economic suppression. So I might have to think about that for a moment, but um, uh, defense groups started to appear. So that was one, one, one thing I thought of as you were kind of trying to consider, okay, so this, this crazy bureaucratic and chaotic stuff is happening, how do you respond? So defense groups is one. But I, I have to think more about, um, I, I would say, based on riffing on what I've told you uh, in the paper, is that you could rely that these edicts would either be poorly applied or ill applied, uh, not applied at all, or rescinded. And you know that pattern kept coming up in the material that I was looking at over the decades. So I'm just guessing a, a, a fairly savvy character would say to himself, well, I'll lie low for a little bit and then back in business when the, the, the ineffective authority doesn't really come through with the punishment. That, that, that's just, but I'm just guessing. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask a, a question uh, going forward to the immigration yes. into North America yes. of so many people from yes. the Pale. In fact, I believe that majority of our Jewish populations in Canada, the right. United States, take their origin from the pale. You're right. Yeah. Um, and I, I ask a question about what was the nature of the intellectual ferment in the Jewish settlements within the pale? Because upon immigration, it just flowered in North America and yeah. it greatly enriched uh, science and the arts and the popular culture. Yeah. And that seemed to happen almost within 10, 20 years of these immigrations. What was it? What was going on within those shtetls that enabled this population? Such a big when, question. In a sense, freed yes. to uh, yeah. contribute so much. So the first thing to think of is the assassination of the Tsar, 1881, and then the May laws and the development of these pogroms. And Immediately in response to this, people are leaving. Uh, the, the idea that the, the, the present wave was one that you would wait out, which was kind of the, maybe the standard approach, uh, went by the wayside. And lots of you here know that at that point, immigration was, fairly, was open. And you even tra you traveled without a passport. Um, the question was the ability to buy the, tra the transport. Now, your, but your other way of, of asking has to do with intellectual or sort of uh, ways of comprehending the idea of leaving. And I would say that that really was something that just developed and changed so quickly in the 1880s and 1890s. So by the 1890s, you really do have the beginning of an idea of political Zionism. And it wasn't something necessarily that was as broadly popular as you'd think about, but young people were interested in it. So that became a new ideological motivator. And the other thing that it, it one, so now I think of a better answer to your question. One response among young people to all of this economic chaos and violence was left socialism. Um, 
so that in the Russian lands and also in big Polish centers, uh, youth organizations and um, unions were so uh, fervently involved in the new left ideologies. And those drove Jews to sometimes want to stay and hopefully revolutionize their society at home, but also to leave for possibilities in places like New York City. So that that would be another ideological development that for young people especially. The older people, I don't, uh, the, the people my age, um, you know, it, it wasn't something that their mindset was gonna change in the way that I imagine it doing for young people. So I, I think too of it as a generational divide in terms of what one thinks that makes one leave or what one needs to make one leave. I don't, know, I don't know if I'm being too uh, vague in my way of, of answering. Um, and then the, the reality is that the United States was letting everybody in. So that too is not exactly what you're asking about, but uh, the enticements were great and the ability was straightforward. Ideology is important too. Uh, am, I, am I following your, your question? Or? I guess I'm presuming that within these villages that one of the responses to the dire activities around them was somehow a great stimulation of yes. education. Oh. And that people were primed uh, to be thoughtful and to take forward uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. ideas and new ideas. Fair enough. That when they arrived in North America, Fair enough. suddenly... Well put. Boom. Well put. Everything but flowers, <laughs> and it flowered fairly rapidly after okay. they first arrived. That's well put. The place where you can find those developments taking shape, and there's a lot of this published now, is in young people's diaries. Diary writing was like the internet in that period, and uh, young Jewish men and women were largely triliterate or, mo or more, and they had private lives very different from their parents, so they express themselves so carefully and in great detail in terms of their ideas in their diaries. So when you go to these young people's diaries, you see this process happening. Yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a good resource for, for seeing how, how, the, how these minds were working. Thank you, Neil. I am very cognizant of the time. So uh, I know that there were one or two other hands. Uh, Neil is going to be signing books at the back. He has copies of his books here. And so if you do have a burning question, he's able to answer. But um, There was one there. Go ahead. Mary, sorry. My question was rather lighthearted. Good. <laughs> I tried some of that too myself. <laughs> um, you talk an awful lot about how important booze was booze. and uh, to the commerce. You use that example over and over but again. Is that happenstance because of something in your life? No. Or was that, <laughs> no. was it really the linchpin that you made it sound like? <laughs> well, I suppose if we had done an economic talk, I would have been obliged to include other uh, economic frameworks as well. Uh, but it really is, it really was a very important one. And it's one that reflects the Polish Jewish relationship so well because it was this kind of unusual deal that was cut between the, the Jewish manor manager and the nobleman. And then it was the thing that the Russians come along and say to themselves, no more of this. So it happens to fit nicely in our challenge tonight of thinking about the pale as a kind of a Russian project. And part of the project was to destroy this economy. Uh, but you know, uh, <clears throat> they grow a lot of rye in Poland. You know, and, and, and we a drink lot a lot too. <laughs> uh, uh, and so I, I myself have not properly studied that industry in the 19th century. But uh, one gets the feeling as you look at the materials that yeah, the, the, the economic nexus there for Poland Jew, very important. And then retains this kind of strange importance when the Russians come and try to take the whole thing apart. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. 
Thank you once again, uh, Norman, and thank you to our audience for your attendance, your participation, and your interest in NLC this evening. But there's more. Tomorrow morning, Norman will share an intimate yet historical Canadian perspective on Canada's own metaphorical walls of the past with reference to Jewish immigration in the early 18, 1980s, uh, sorry, 1930s. The talk will take place at Port Hope Library at 10 a.m., and there are still a few tickets available on the NLC website. Next week, we will wrap up Borders and Walls by looking at walls through an artistic yet political lens with Warren Carter's talks on muralism, followed the next day by contemporary street art, a.k.a. graffiti, for those of us with gray hair. We haven't necessarily saved the best for last, but I'm confident you'll enjoy this colorfully enriching dialogue. Uh, once again, uh, Susan, are there books back there? Uh, they did not show up. Well, once again, Norman, thank you on behalf of all of us for quite an enlightening conversation. And good night.